I'm very pleased to be with you, and I, I thank the organizers for inviting me to make this presentation. Um, I must say that the uh, title of it is a bit misleading. But before going into the story, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of my friend and colleague, Bruno Bussière, who has been uh, involved in many of my projects over the years. So, uh, as Ward mentioned, um, in 2001, we created an answer chair uh, that, uh, was, that has run for 12 years. And this is a publicity that appeared in the CIM magazine in uh, 2011 to celebrate the 10th year of the chair. Uh, this publicity has been paid by the partners of the industrial chair, and you see them on the screen. There are two consulting firms, uh, mining companies and uh, a provincial agency, plus, of course, ANSERC. And uh, today, I will talk about the work that has been done through the 12 years, along the 12 years of the chair, and also the transition toward RIME. RIME meaning a research institute on mines and the environment. And this is an, a new umbrella organization that was officially created uh, in April 2013, uh, but it has been um, in the mill for a number of years before that. And you see at the bottom the sponsors and the participants to RIME. Uh, so the outline of the presentation will be to describe a bit um, in about 45 minutes the work that has been done, or some of the work that has been done uh, by the chair and the collaborators of the chair, uh, and some of the key outputs. And at the same time, I will uh, point out some of the work that will be done over the coming years. And because I cannot deal with all the issues and projects that were um, addressed during the chair, and that will be addressed in the coming years, I will focus mostly on some of the issues that you should be interested by, including tailings and waste rock management, underground disposal of, of uh, tailings and waste rock, sludge disposal, covers and reclamation, and at the end there will be a few final remarks. Because I will be uh, dealing with the work that we have done over the years, there will be a very limited number of references in the slides, and I apologize for that. So some of you may be frustrated by the fact that I will not be mentioning your work. It's probably not because I don't know it, but it's because of a time constraint for this presentation. So because you're all in the mining business, you're well aware of the challenges that we're facing. And when we're operating mines, we produce naturally large volume of waste that must be managed properly. There are a number of challenges, and some of them relate to physical or geotechnical stability, and others relate to geochemical stability, and sometimes we have both at the same time. It's when we win the jackpot. And in both cases, it can create some havoc for the environment if we're not careful. The impact of mining operations depend on a number of factors. The first one may be the mining method being used, uh, of course, the type of ore and rock, and many others, as you will see. During the presentation, you will see a number of pictures, and most of them are taken from our bank of pictures of photos that we took over the years, and they are taken from sites with, on which we have been working on, and I will mention some of them uh, along the way. So I mentioned the mining method because it, it plays a big role in the way you manage your waste and the, the amount of waste you have to deal with. For instance, in the case of, of uh, open pit mines to reach the ore zone, you have to excavate large volume of waste rock. And in this case, for hard rock mines at least, on average uh, in Canadian operations, about 65% of the rock that is being excavated will be waste rock, only 35% or so. Uh, would be the ore uh, that will become the tailings. Of course, it changes from one side to the rest, but this is an average value. So it shows that for um, surface operations, you do have some uh, large waste rock piles. This is uh, uh, an example for the Lacteo mine uh, north of uh, Havre Saint Pierre in the eastern part of Quebec. And this mine has been operating for uh, over 40 years. And they have uh, created a number of large waste rock piles. The one that we see here is the one in the back. It, with the, the, 
its uh, foot in the water. Uh, this one is 120 meters above water, and this is a, a significant height. Uh, in the case of underground mines, though, uh, you, the, the uh, the, the uh, ratio is quite different. Uh, usually you have only about 10% of the extracted rock that will become waste rock. Again, it varies from one mine to the other, but 90% would be the ore. And uh, in this case, you have much smaller um, waste rock pile. They can be problematic, but they are smaller. Like the one at the bottom, we see it's the Laurent mine close to Val d'Or. Um, the ore itself is sent to the mill to recover the concentrate or the precious metals, depending on the type of ore. And at the same time, you produce tailings. And we've been dealing mostly with hard rock mines. And tailings from hard rock mines are mainly silt type of material, initially very loose in a saturated state with a relatively low hydraulic conductivity. The pulp density, the solid density, is usually between 20 to 45 percent, uh, I should say maybe 30 to 45 percent. You're, you're probably aware of the reasons why we produce so much of these tailings and waste rock. It's because of the limited amount or valuables in our rock. Uh, at today's price of gold, for instance, to extract one gram of gold, you would produce between two and three tons of tailings in addition to the waste rock that will be produced. So this explains why the challenges are significant. So we've been dealing with uh, a number of issues, as I will explain in the following. Uh, surface disposal of waste rock in the form of piles that we don't call dump because we don't believe they are dumps, they are engineered structures. Uh, surface disposal of tailings in impoundments. Underground disposal of tailings as backfill or waste rock as backfill. And also um, water treatment system. In the case when you have, for instance, uh, acidic effluents, you have to treat the water. So all of these issues will be addressed briefly in the following. First, it, it is useful to remind for the, those of you who are not familiar with ANSERC, ANSERC is a National Science and Engineering Research Council. It's somewhat equivalent to NSF in the US. And it is an organization that funds university research, not only university, but mostly re university research. And they have the IRC program, Industrial Research Chair program, which is providing matching funds to universities for research chair, like ours, uh, to support uh, their research that has already been funded by industry. So it's a matching fund, so for every dollar you get at least another dollar for your, uh, your research, and this is meant to address important issues for the companies involved, but also for the industry as a whole, for the community, and for the country in general. Our chair, and uh, we, we see the logo here, uh, involved two universities, Ecole Polytechnique, which is the engineering faculty of the University of Montreal, where I work. Also, uh, Université du Québec, en Abitibi de Miskaming, which is located in the Rouen Rando, in the uh, mining area, west uh, of Quebec, and uh, a number of mining companies that you see here, and consulting firms, and a provincial agency. At the time it was created in 2001, I believe it was the first one of this type uh, recognized by ANSERC uh, to deal with mine waste management. Over the years, though, many others have been created, including one by Ward. Our chair uh, really relied on uh, a significant number of resources. Uh, of course, the two uh, main ones were the chair, myself, and Bruno Bussia, but also the, the positions that were open because of this allowed us to hire three younger colleagues uh, that are mentioned here, Gérald Zaguri, Mustafa Benzazoua, and Mamel Bonimpa, plus other collaborators, and you will see their names in many of our w publications over the years. Um, one of the goals of the RRC program is to train highly qualified personnel. During phase one, from 2001 to 2006, 60 graduate students were involved in our program. And the, the original goal in our proposal in 2000 was 22. And it was judged to be unrealistic. Uh, if, for the second phase, which lasted almost seven years until December 2012, 
20, uh, 79 graduate students were involved, including 30 PhDs, 42 masters, and seven postdoctoral fellows. And many undergrads also have been involved. Um, the chair allowed us to uh, obtain new laboratory facilities at both locations with different types of, of uh, equipments so that we do not overlap too much. Um, we, uh, most of the research that we have done has been published uh, in the open literature, so all of what I'll be presenting today is available. Just get in touch with me and I will send you the uh, proper uh, references. So over the years, uh, for, for instance, during the phase two, we published uh, 120 journal papers and 160 conference papers. The numbers don't say much, but the point is that it allows us to get out the information as quickly as possible so that it is available for those who have an interest in these areas. We have a, our own symposium that we organize every three years since 2002. Uh, many of you have had the have been attending some of these, uh, have been invited in some cases to attend, including Ward and many others. The next one, by the way, will be in the spring of 2015, so there's a, a gap, an additional gap b before the next one. And we've been involved in a number of conferences, workshops, and short courses. Now I would like to focus on some specific projects that have been conducted over the years, among the eight main ones that were run by the industrial chair, and that in many cases will continue through Rhyme. We're dealing, as I said, with hard rock mines, and uh, in the case of tailings, these uh, materials are fine grained. You're well aware of that. They are initially very loose, saturated, and, and they have no cohesion at the saturated state. They can be highly susceptible to a number of problems, including static and uh, dynamic liquefaction. Uh, they often contain reactive minerals like sulfides, pyrite, pyrodite, and so on. And um, it is well known also that the tailings impoundment, the dikes around uh, tailings impoundment are prone to uh, failure rates that are well above those of classical dikes or end dams. So I will uh, address uh, specifically some of the issues that we've been working on. Uh, to start with, with improved surface disposal of tailings. And I will mention briefly some of the issues related to physical stability, that is geotechnical stability, environmental desulfurization, and thicken and paste tailings. The picture you see at the bottom is the Boulian Ulu site in the early years, in 2004. We started working with Barrick on this site and Golder, and you're all familiar these days with thicken and paste tailings. When you're allowed to reduce the amount of water so that the, uh, the, the pulp density or the solid content would go in the range of classical tailings between 30 to 45 to uh, up to 70% for thickened tailings uh, and, and between 70 and 85% for paste tailings. And there are a number of advantages dealing with that. And Paul Sims, for instance, uh, mentioned that during his presentation. You can recover the water and use it for other purposes and preserve it. You can increase the storage volume in, in the short term. You have uh, different properties sometimes, a lower hydraulic conductivity because of the reduced porosity of the material, higher air entry value, higher water retention, which can be an advantage in some cases, and also in some cases, higher strength. Uh, but there are some critical issues that you have to be aware of, uh, and uh, one of them is related to the fact that during deposition, because you have less water, many of these uh, paste tailings, especially paste tailings, are prone to desaturation. And if you have reactive minerals, like in the case of the Bully site in Tanzania, then you have to worry about oxygen ingress, because oxygen, of course, will react with the reactive minerals and may produce acid mine drainage or acid rock drainage. And this, of course, is a, a main issue, a main concern for the environmental protection of the surrounding sites. Um, but there are some specific advantages, and one of them that we've been working on is the fact that if you allow the tailings to desaturate, you will increase its strength. And one of the reasons for an increased strength, beside the fact that you reduce the porosity, is that you create a suction in the system. And this suction, as you well know, create some apparent cohesion. So we have developed a simple testing system or uh, 
protocol to test, to do bending tests on small samples of tailings under unsaturated conditions to determine the tensile strength and the apparent cohesion. And what you see here are results that are, have been partly published so far that shows the increased of apparent cohesion as a function of the degree of saturation. Of course, when the system, when the tailings are saturated, their cohesion is nil. But you see, it, it's not negligible. It, it can be a, a significant cohesion that is in, induced by the tensile stresses that are created under uh, unsaturated conditions. At the same time, you have to worry because of, of another effect of unsaturated conditions. Uh, if you have reactive minerals, as I mentioned, you will have the possibility of oxygen diffusion and reaction with the system. And these are tests, and we've conducted field tests on the Bully site and other sites, as you will see later, and also in the lab to measure the oxidation rate of the exposed tailings. And what the results see, uh, show, and this is one typical result, is that if you maintain the suction in your close to the surface, below the air entry value of your tailing, which in this case is about 45 kPa, then the oxygen in this test, which is the modified oxygen concentration test, again, it's been published, uh, will remain about the same. It doesn't change much. So there's very little oxidation because you don't desaturate your material enough. However, if you exceed the air entry value close to the surface, then you desaturate the material. So going, for instance, from 40, 42 kPa to 52 kPa, then you see oxygen depletion in your reservoir. This is a small reservoir. And this means that the oxygen is being consumed. And uh, the result of that would be production of the Vassin man drainage. And the higher the suction, the more desaturation you have, the more prone to oxidation you will be. Um, another project we've been working on is environmental desaturation. What you see at the bottom is a mobile system that we have that can move from one mine to the other. And the goal here, and, and some of you have been working on this in the past, is to separate the reactive fraction and the non-reactive fraction. And so you, you it, with, uh, at the mill, this is usually by flotation process, uh, you would produce a concentrate which is made mostly of the sulfide minerals and a desulfurized portion of the tailings, which in many cases will, will be the bulk of your tailings. So you manage the two separately. In some cases, the concentrate can be sent underground as cemented paste backfields, as you will see in one of the future slides. And the desulfurized tailings can be used for many different purposes, including building covers. And this is an example of an experimental pile ongoing now where desulfurized tailings are being used as cover material. Uh, moving on to some work we've done on waste rock pile. Um, Waste rock pile is, uh, um, in, in, it can be a, a funny beast uh, and difficult be beast to deal with. Uh, we've been working on methods of characterization for both hydrogeological and geochemical behavior using, in some cases, geophysical tools, hydrogeological modeling, and modified disposal approach. And I will be mentioning those with the arrow in the future slides. At the same time, we developed some tools for water quality prediction, including reactive transport um, softwares to predict acid mine drainage and uh, also other geochemical processes. Um, as you know, uh, piles, which are called sometimes dumps, uh, as I said, this is not a term that we favor because it, it is somewhat misleading again. Uh, they uh, should be constructed as uh, engineered structure, and they must be planned carefully, especially if you have uh, conditions like these one, you, where you have a single slope, and, and this is a, a procedure and a deposition method that should be avoided as much as possible for reasons that you will see. And uh, this, by the way, has been addressed more extensively in a presentation I made during the summer at the World Mining Congress, where Ward also was making presentation. And, and this is a problem that we see on some sites where you have cracks appearing on top of the piles. And of course, this, is, this can become very dangerous. And in this case, uh, it, it condemns pretty much the pile. You cannot go back because it becomes unstable. Even though it's not full sliding, you see 
the effect of the cracking on top. And, and this has been happening at a number of sites over the world, and this can be very dangerous. So we've been working on a number of techniques, both in the lab and in the field, to obtain properties of waste rock. Of course, this is a challenging issue because of the widespread grain size of the material. So we have to use non-conventional testing methods like large columns and, and tubs and physical models of all sorts to characterize the properties, the mechanical properties and the hydrogeological properties. Um, much of the work we have done has been conducted in the field. And uh, these are different types of tests that I will show, uh, including geochemical analysis. These are leaching cells on a mine site that uh, have been constructed a few years back to address the quality, the water quality issue, and also infiltration tests. And when we talk about field tests, we talk about expensive tests. And one way to reduce the cost is, of course, to use students. And uh, <laughs> I apologize for this one. Uh, so many of these tests have been run by uh, students during their master and PhDs. And, and this is an example of a, uh, a combined type of testing where you measure uh, the infiltration rate under controlled condition, but at the same time, you monitor using geophysical uh, probes, and we don't see well, but there are some rods here to measure the uh, resistivity of the system, and also using georadar. We're able to follow the infiltration and the motion of water, which in many cases is not moving downward, but follows some features inside the piles. Um, these tests, uh, especially with geophysics, uh, geophysical tools, have been run on uh, surface of piles, on sides of piles like this one, inside boreholes and, and many others, and also in trenches where we can sample the material at the same time and, and obtain additional information that allow us to correlate what is seen from the geophysical point of view to the hydrogeological and geotechnical point of view. From these results, and, and of course this again has been published uh, before, uh, we were able to build a kind of a cartoon type of waste rock pile where we uh, have established the typical type of internal structure. And we're all familiar with the inclined layers, and Ward Wilson, for instance, has done quite a bit of work on this. And uh, so you, we have these inclined layers with boulders at the base because you have segregation and finer material close to the top. You also have the effect of uh, compacted layers due to the machinery that is working, that is moving on top of these surfaces. And we see in the picture the drop of a load and, and segregation with boulders at the base. From this, we did some analysis of how water moves inside pile. Of course, there are a number of, of ways to represent the pile. It can be considered as being homogeneous, which we know is not the case, or include some of the features that we have just seen. And what I will show here will focus only on the horizontal layers. Of course, we, we have done additional calculations with the inclined layers, and this has been done also by others.